one, two. One, two. Good, that's working. Hello and welcome to our How to Repair Pendulum Clocks live stream uh, all the way from sunny York. Uh, nice to see the live chat there fired up already. So evening Ken, uh, two Kens, uh, Franklin uh, from the Netherlands and uh, Derek. So um, thank you for joining us. Uh, We're making progress with our 18th century, early 19th century, sorry, European toll case clock. And as you may have seen from the trailer, today is last chance saloon for the gathering pallet. And uh, so we're going to keep our high in, keep everything crossed that we can um, retain this component. So uh, this bit of background to this channel it's all part of our sort of support network for clock repairers, uh, particularly beginners, uh, particularly anybody who bought our book, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, Volume 1, Getting Started, or our, or and even our uh, e-publication on depthing and bushing. A little bit of a commercial break here. So um, it's uh, our, uh, when you start in clock repair, one of the kind of rites of passage, I think, is this idea of something called bushing. I won't explain what it is uh, here. We do talk about it on these live streams. Anyway, we wrote an e-publication all about that. So thank you for those who have bought it. Anyway, hi, David. Uh, evening from Edinburgh. Great. Good to see you all. Um, so... Yeah, as always, busy old, like non-stop horological week here. There's a lot going on. Uh, we've got our YouTube stuff. We've got this. We've got the event on the Saturday, Open Clock Club, which I think is in its 35th or 36th week now. And um, making some videos. Uh, did a bit of watch work this week, which I put out on this uh, Read Repairs channel and so on. Anyway, on the Facebook group, thank you so much to everybody in the Facebook group who contributes to that. It's absolutely brilliant. Luckily, it's kind of simmered down a bit and hopefully it's reached a kind of nice equilibrium. So it's great to see your work in progress. Uh, uh, videos and images and comments and questions. So keep going. Right. OK, so our gathering palette. Here it is uh, for people who are new here. This clock of ours has got two uh, gear trains and uh, one of those tells the time and the other one strikes the number of hours on the hour. And this wheel or mobile is part of that mechanism. And um, this component rotates uh, that way uh, as you're looking at it. And it's part of the hour striking uh, counting mechanism. There's a second component here it's this thing called the gathering pallet. And as you might be able to see, there's a bit of it missing. Should be a good tight fit on here, uh, but it's all wobbly, so it doesn't work. Uh, so we're trying to repair it. Last week I had a go at um, hard soldering, which is soldering with silver, effectively like a silversmith might. And um, that didn't work out. The thing's been repaired before. It's got some lead solder, soft solder on it, so the hard solder wouldn't stick, didn't work. 
falling apart. And you might say, well, just make a new one or buy a new one, uh, Matthew. So you could make a new one or buy a new one. However, I'm going to have one more go now at rescuing it. Rescuing it. Sorry, it's slightly uh, pejorative or emotive term. Um, and then if it doesn't work, then yeah, well, I'm going to have to think about next steps. So what I've done here is uh, because uh, part of it fell away, this bit here, if you can see that bit's missing altogether, that gave me opportunity to get a needle file, a little square needle file, and file in there, sorry, that way around. The hole is tapered, by the way, the square and the hole is tapered. File in there. Hi, Jeremy, evening. Um, <laughs> it's a long story about the uh, getting married thing. Uh, nothing's ever quite as straightforward as it seems, is it? Anyway, um, the, <laughs> the file is tapered to the problem with files when you buy them by them is that they're pretty much useless. So rather than buy them and throw them straight in the bin, what you can do is modify them to make them actually useful. And what you can see here, if I get it in the light, is that um, I've ground off with a whetstone two of the bases of teeth. There's still a bit there, but I've basically made it so this is a safe-ish edge and this is a safe-ish edge. And what that means is you can actually file into the corner because this wasn't a proper square before. It was square-ish with rounded corners, which is no good. Anyway, so I've tidied um, up inside here. I hope gotten rid of all the lead solder because lead solder and silver solder don't mix. That's the problem with lead soldering anything. So remember, you will be familiar with this drill if you're a regular here. And if you're not, then it's new territory. So there are three kind of rules of soldering. The main rule is that everything you want to solder must be clean. Uh, so get off any oxide, old work, down to bare metal, add flux, which keeps things clean and reduces the surface tension of the solder as well and then get the thing up to the right temperature. And you've got to have somewhere for the flux to the solder to run. So what I did was I got a bit of bushing wire, uh, bushing wire, and I drilled it sort of slightly almost impossible to see on the camera, I know, to a cross flat size of our arbor here. So I drilled it about 1.4 millimeters or something like that. And then I filed it to a square, then filed the corners of that square and what I'm hoping, lots of hoping here, is that when I solder this in, uh, that'll give me a start to file a new square inside the bit of brass. So it'll be a kind of mix of uh, the brass and the silver solder and the steel, and it'll be a good tight fit. It might not work, but as I said, this is a last chance saloon. So you can see I've got some blue pen on there, and the purpose of the blue pen is so I could see where the two components were touching so I can get them to be a reasonable uh, fit. So um, with no response from the live chat yet, uh, Team Open Clock Club is at actual real work at the moment. Uh, they may appear and help out at some point. Um, but it's coming up to the summer, sort of not exactly recess for uh, work. Uh, but that reminds me that we too are going to have a recess or a vacation uh, for August. So I don't know how long we've been doing... Party, party going on outside. I don't know how long we've been doing this live stream, maybe four months, something like that. So what we're going to do with next week will be our last week of this run. Um, and then we will start again in September, uh, the first Thursday in September, whatever that is. It's, I think it's about the 7th or 8th, is it? It must cover many more than the 7th, can it, by definition? Anyway, so cleaning uh, the bit of brass up here, because although I only filed this today, brass tarnishes very quickly. And I also have gotten that blue pen on it. So making this really super clean. And I'm using 4 knot steel wool, which is a really useful tool to have around the workshop. Just be careful when you're using it because of the fire hazard and also that you don't inhale the little, you see the little bits of steel. So it's a good idea if you're using a lot of this to use a mask. Um, often when I'm using it for cleaning, 
I would use it with something like uh, Renaissance wax to keep the fibers uh, down a little bit. Um, oh, hi, Vicky, also from Edinburgh. Wow, gosh. Um, and uh, we're talking about the Facebook group. I don't know if you're here, Vicky, but thanks for your contribution um, with the French clock project, de rusting project. Uh, lots of um, stories to come from that project, yeah, but really, really cool stuff. Going to stick. Um, yeah, the, it's really, I think there's one thing me banging on about um, how I kind of think things should be fixed. Uh, but of course, that's actually only helpful to a degree. What's really useful are to see so called real projects, working projects. So it's really, you know, heartening when somebody puts a picture of a clock up there and they say, Look what I did, fix this clock, which is great. But it doesn't actually, I and mean, it's helpful as, as in it's an encouragement. Um, but it doesn't really help sort of people understand what that process involved. So work in progress and reflections are brilliant, sort of what's and all. We don't mind when things went good or when things didn't go quite so good either. There's a question, do you use a knife with your pegwood or do you use the file with your pegwood? I do both. But actually, filing with the cost file is as good as uh, most things. And this knife, I've got maybe got another one of these somewhere, pegwood type knife that we bought in 1974, believe it or not, uh, in the family shop. Anyway, so all I'm shouting that pegwood for is to clean up the inside of. Oh, Vicky says the only way is up with that project. Uh, <laughs> good. You just got to keep going, haven't you, with these things? They, they can seem sort of like endless beasts of burden at some point, but you just got to keep going and uh, you will get there. It might take some time, but you will definitely get there. And the thing is, you look back in years to come and um, maybe that's another challenge of seeing lots of people putting clocks up and saying hey i fixed this which is great as i said but they don't see the blood set and sweat and tears of losing parts on the floor or breaking pivots off or um uh, our um derek um of course has been telling us about his uh, westminster striking clock with the pinion which has been like a massive saga should be made into a feature film one day but Derek's kept going and kept sharing the project and I think uh, pretty much has gotten there. Now, I, for the last I remember, it's working and up and running. So, yeah, it's easy to throw your hands up in the air and um, do something easier. But when was easy ever any good? Right, so I'm making a bit of a meal of cleaning this up because I'm hoping and praying that this is the last time that... Uh, we have to try and fix it. Who knows? Anyway, there we go. So let's just get this junk out of the way and get our soldering board across here. And the gathering palette. Here's our flux. So we use this uh, at the moment. I'm kind of sold on this uh, traditional borax cone type flux. Seems to work good enough for me. And let's get out a bit of brass. Now, what I've done is I've taken one of these refactory blocks and I've drilled an hole in it because what I want is um, I need my glasses. What I want is the block not to touch the area of work that we're actually soldering. I want that to be kind of um, not um, not in the block. So it all will be revealed in a minute. But. Um, yeah, I think that's about as clean as I can get it without filing it completely away. So one of our flux brushes, natural hair brush, bit of water in there, a bit more flux. I often find with these things, there's a lot of um, kind of building up to the job 
uh, which I suppose is a bit of a luxury of doing it this way that you might not get if you're working more commercially, you just get to work faster and faster and faster, which is a beautiful thing in its own right. But um, got this luxury of not exactly being under the cosh for time. So we put a bit of um, flux on our gathering palette from Sa and flux on our bit of brass. There we go. And we can, uh, there is a right way around for this. So let's just pop those, sorry, see, pop those things together like that. And then I want to let's just move it across a little bit. Into the, there we are. Frame. There's lots going on there with old repairs and things. So I don't want this to move when I'm uh, soldering it. So I'm just going to pop a couple of pins in to hold it down. Um, and what I'm hoping, and hoping is the word, uh, is that I've already lost that bit of wood. There it is. Um, we have solder at this end and we have some solder at that end. So I might actually just apply it um, while we're heating rather than put little chunks on there. I don't know yet, quite thought that far through. So from our um, Open Clock Club on Saturday, we had some good feedback from the video on the Fusey clock and the chain and all that, not the chain, sorry, the Fusey line. Uh, one one of our uh, YouTube viewers, obviously that event takes place when it's um, 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night or something for a lot of people, so they can't see it live. And uh, so it's lovely when people leave comments and one uh, viewer has just finished building John Wilding's, uh, must be, well, some kind of fusey driven clock. And he put a phosphor bronze line on there and I was having a bit of go at phosphor bronze line. So he's taken it off and put a gut line on. So that's nice to have a bit of influence there. So I'll just put a couple of taper pins into Stop it from moving about too much. Everything tends to float around when it gets hot with the flux as well. So it's just good to kind of have it a little bit at least sort of um, under control, maybe isn't quite the right word, but that's the idea. So yeah, we're going to um, we'll carry on with Open Clock Club through August, but we're going to uh, have a vacation from the live stream. And when we come back, uh, I should have gotten there. Probably not. not actually, I have like a break, but that, that's fine. When we come back, um, I think uh, the clock should be all. I'll re-clean it because I did some preliminary cleaning, but it wasn't massively kind of thorough. And um, so our first session when I come back should be uh, reassembly and then we can get it ticking and I can make some hands and then we can actually talk about the next clock. We've got an American clock in. Um, which is uh, very much what people call a barn find now. It's all dusty and spies, spiders webs and things. So uh, there we are. So we'll probably do that next, I think. Uh, we've got so many clocks to fix, uh, of course. As you can see, that's not massively secure, but at least it's not going to float about too much. So here's our uh, trusty um, spool of silver solder. Again, just for those people who are joining us for the first time, there are broadly two kinds of soldering that we do in these 
our logical repairs. One is soft solder with either lead or tin based solders. This kind of stuff that you use in electronics, which is good because it's relatively low heat. So it's less damaging to the components, but it can, it's good if there's a big surface area, but it's not massively strong. And then there's hard solder, which is another name for soft for silver soldering like this, which is much stronger, but it's much higher heat. So usual story, you don't get out for now. Um, and then there's brazing, which is soldering with brass, which we rarely do. You see on old clocks, uh, sometimes collets are brazed onto the rubbers. Uh, situation going on. Right, so not only clean the work, but also clean the solder as well. So I've just cleaned that with um, you know, from a pliers on my keyboard. That typing actually isn't from me. It's because I've put the pliers on my keyboard. So let me just think this through. So can I get my solder in there and solder my... I probably can. I think I'm going to do it like that because... I don't mind there being a lot of solder on this. Hopefully it won't run into the ball of the uh, of the work. Otherwise that will make me weep. So as you can see, just going to put a little block up there to reflect some heat back so we don't have to heat it so much. Um, right, I think we're good to go. Um, ideally, it's good to do this with the lights lower because you can then see when the metal begins to glow and get up to the right temperature. But obviously that doesn't work here. And it's a really bright, sunny evening. Watching the silt, the flux boil, or the water boil, then the flux will begin to melt. And when the flux goes uh, vitreous or glassy looking, and the work begins to glow till red, you can get the silver in. Right, but I really went through there with a big blow of solder on top. I thought, no, this is it. It's, it's now or never. Okay, that was quite good. Um, as I said before, many times um, because of the, uh, yeah, it just <laughs> it's got time for me to scare myself with my own blowtorch. Um, this silver soldering, if you've not done it, get some solder. I say this every time and just practice because if you get the thing clean, flux on, temperature right put the solder on it flows beautifully it's really strong and it's really satisfying if you don't do that and you're not practiced when you come to repair something it will go wrong and it's really like really frustrating uh we soldered on our extension on our arbor here and you can see how um incredibly neat it turned out any road up uh, let's have a look And um, could have actually put more um, solder on there. Let me just have a Well, what I did put on there has flowed into the gap. So I think um, rather than heat it up again, I'll call that a day uh, in two minds. Anyway, let's just see uh, see what it looks like. I, I think I'm just going to go with that 
I will actually, if it doesn't work, I will actually solder on another bit, believe it or not. My next plan is to solder on a bit of steel tubing, uh, drill out a bit of uh, silver steel wire or something. But I won't um, torture you with that. I think we've, um, we're, we're still, <laughs> we're writing our second book, which is about the two train Smith's Enfield clock. And I've spent more time than anybody on the planet, than, than even the people who made uh, those clocks thinking about and writing about the gathering palette. So it's like I'm kind of gathering palleted out at the moment. Uh, okay, ooh, YouTube videos are popping up. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling pretty chilled out today. Uh, I think it was Sam, wasn't it, last week saying, is it really hot? It was 29 before I started with a blow torch in here. So it's, it's all right, it's okay. Um, seeing franklin there i follow one or two people who uh do youtube from the nurburgring and see all the floods and things and wondered whether franklin's in that part of the netherlands where they've had the floods right okay so i'll leave that to um just clean up a little bit it's my brush uh where is my brush There's a question. Probably a good opportunity to use the fiberglass on there, given that the whole, the poor thing is pretty um, sort of distressed already. At least that'll help us clean off some flux. Yeah, the next clock we're going to work on on this um, channel uh, in September uh, is not going to take as long as this. It's not going to be such a massive um, kind of undertaking. We do actually have um, three long case clocks that I bought before this one turned up the pub clock, and they're like total train wrecks. I, I don't think I'm going to subject anybody to those. But maybe individual... Um, sort of uh pieces that need fixing but not the whole thing like this because it's it's uh quite torturous i think um but yeah the american clock that i was given as a donation is really cool i think we can do that in wishful thinking maybe in a couple of weeks or something not a massive job lots of cleaning and um and i'll probably need a lot of help from you people because i don't know anything about american clocks i've fixed a couple before well, they're not sort of part of my everyday practice here. So um, not something I'm massively familiar with, the open springs and things. So this, is, this kind of cleaning is a little bit brutal, really, compared to what I would normally do. But uh, as I say, given that we've just hard sold the thing, it's less brutal than throwing it away, that's for sure. Uh, white vinegar. Experiment. He said rather cheekily, smiling. Don't ask me where I got it from. <laughs> Is it white vinegar out of the fucking... It may be. It's going to go and rinse off the vinegar. Uh, I just thought it might be useful to get rid of the flux, and it seems to have done a good job. Um, as you can see, that it's really sort of cleaned up there cleaned up the brass. So just a bit of an experiment. Go wash, give it a rinse. Yes, if you... Um, I think that uh, on terms of using stuff around the kitchen, we've got our dial kind of silvering session coming up. And um, so we've got all sorts of stuff there. And in fact, I noticed that a package came from Bulgaria 
uh, today. So very exciting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's something to do with dial soldering, possibly. It's come from a laboratory in Bulgaria. So again, lots of sort of um, experimentation. So let's sew off our best bit of pipe, which was just there to um, hold, make it easier to hold. So I'm going to leave it, uh, leave it long for the time being. Of course, no point in cutting it off short. So I'll leave it about a millimetre or so long. All right, okay. Uh, this might be um, right. The solder has filled up the hole. That's where it all went. Uh, <laughs> this may not be successful. I did wonder whether I should leave it longer at the top. So, uh, but yeah, what was there, a nicely drilled out hole is now uh, solid. Right, okay. Gosh, tricky thing. Says, why don't you do torsion clock next? Oh, yeah, well, I have that one, yeah, so I, I could do, yeah, yeah, that's an idea. Oh, in fact, I don't know what I'm talking about, but yeah, right. Oh, that's totally crazy because the um, the solder has gotten, even though I left the little pipe quite long at the top end, it's gone round there and inside and totally filled it up with solder. So I think that hasn't worked. But I'm pretty sure that hasn't worked. So what I'm going to do next, and as I say, I won't um, subject you to even more gathering pallet torture, is I'm going to file off this part of it and solder on um, a bit of steel. Uh, a bit of, it doesn't have to be pipe. It could actually just be U-shaped. I'm still, uh, I said it was the last chance saloon, didn't I, which is probably a bit of a fib, because I'm still reluctant to throw it away because it's quite nice. And uh, this part of it, the actual working bit is okay, um, but I'm not going to be able to drill that out and kind of rescue it because it's, um, I don't think so anyway. No, I think that's, repair was yet another open pot club live stream failure. So um, there you go. i to keep going, just a little bit over. Hold her off. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm pretty sure it's just completely filled up the gap. Anyway, there you go. It just shows what, uh, what this material can do when you don't want it to do that. But when you want it to do that, of course, Kind of hoping there's a a hole in there, and it's only filled the end. But I'm pretty sure it's filled up the whole thing, which is why solder all disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, so next thing is um, a bit of steel pipe or square or something like that. I'll probably just file a little channel um, in a piece of steel and then uh, solder that. You can see the soldering. There's no need for me to go through that again. It's exactly the same process with steel, uh, but we will get it so that is a uh, success. Right, uh, but not today. So what's next? Um, we saw last week that our dial needs a bit of work so let's just have a, a bit of a square up and then we'll have a look at our dial some space 
So the whole, um, we're not going to be able to get the whole dial in, of course, because it's bigger than the uh, publicly accessible area of the bench top. <laughs> so with painted dials, um, I'm really obviously a massive fan of just basically leaving them as they are getting, oh, well, I don't even know where to start. A, a paintings conservator is the person for me to work on them. I have uh, know somebody who does it and uh, I work with somebody that used to be at the Bose Museum who was very, very good. Um, but all I'd want them to do is to consolidate areas like this um, where uh, there have been losses. I'm not particularly bothered about infilling the losses, but what I am interested in is uh, just dealing with these edges here where there's uh, maybe a chance of more losses occurring, maybe here as well around the rivet, and of course here where our dial foot is missing. And I'm actually going to deal with this myself. You can see there's a kind of signature here, which uh, just about make that out. We know, in fact, that it says um, it's Pocklington, isn't it? Remember the name? Fryer or something like that, isn't it? I forgot. It's been... Yeah, yeah. Forgot the name. I've got it written down. Anyway, um, so I'm just really happy with the dial as it is. Uh, I'm going to clean it a bit, surface clean it. And as I said, I would, um, you know, a clock is a multi uh, medium uh, event, uh, often with wood, glass, ceramics, uh, painted surfaces, and so on. So, in my kind of other life, I would talk to a specialist in the treatment of this kind of object. It's just, just a completely different and alien environment. But I get that for um, most of us, uh, that's not really an option. So I'm just interested in consolidation. I am going to do some surface cleaning. I've gotten my uh, smoke sponge here, uh, which is a conservation uh, device tool for cleaning, surface cleaning paper and so on. And I'm going to try with some solvent tests on this deionized water maybe uh, with some uh, Vulpex up, V-U-L-P-E-X uh, in there, and maybe a little bit of um, isopropyl alcohol or something tiny sort of amounts, and I'll do some tests and I'll see how that goes. Otherwise, I'm probably just going to live with uh, the surface we've got. And as I say, um, make friends with the paintings conservator because they're the people who know their way uh, make the way around there. Oh, great. Okay. People talking about Scotland. Um, good. Anyway, that's not really where we're at. Um, just for this consolidated bit, I'll get my... Um, Wow. Yeah, the bottle broke in the post. So uh, I'll move the dial out of the way. For those kind of consolidations, I've got some uh, paraloid, which is an acrylic resin, uh, as you can see here, 10% solution. And um, you can just use this because it's reversible. Uh, you can use it to uh, consolidate the edges of that paint to prevent further losses. And I don't know if you remember our cuckoo clock project, I'm going to use it on there as well. So that's, um, again, another incredibly useful product to have just to glue down the edges of a paint. Sounds looking for a transit blanket. Oh, that's not, it's a bit clumsy. I'll just put some um, acid-free tissue paper down instead, probably. 
better surface. Fryer, is it? Is it Fryer? F R Y E R? Right, Fryer, remembered. So here we've got the back of the dial. And uh, I remembered last week there are a couple of things that we need to do, including making a dial foot down here. Now, there's a good question here because this thing's got three, uh, I don't know what's happened, the pin's dropped out. It's got three dial feet and um, it's only got, so it's, it had four dial feet and three false plate uh, feet. And one of the actual dial feet has somehow fallen off or broken off or maybe when it fell on the floor, who knows? Um, so if this was pinned, this is actually kind of remarkably stable. And there's an argument for just leaving it um, with a hole in the dial. You know, it's not going to go anywhere. All the that thing does is hold the dial in place. And if I were to pin that properly, this is cast iron, remember, pinned well here, here and here. It's incredibly stable. I mean, there's a bit of giving it. Um, however, we're a cloth repair channel, so I probably will make a new dial foot. So that's what we'll look at now. And the other thing is the date ring here is like completely inoperable as it, inoperable. That's not the right word, is it? Anyway, it's not working. So let's just pop these pins out and have a look at what we've got underneath. Um, so we've already cleaned the, uh, the dial plate in our normal way by scrubbing it. I used paraffin or something and um, left these lovely paint splats on there. Really like that. I saw there's a paint, a clock on eBay. No, it was in the Facebook group of the day that I made the mistake of looking at where somebody had been very proudly gotten rid of all the paint splats. And but anyway, there you go, each to their own. So this is all cool and done. And I treated it with Renaissance wax. So that's uh, out the way. However, when we look at um, our date disc, you can see uh, it's had a bit of an accident. Squidged over. Um, so that's going to need a bit of sorting out. If it's going to work, we could leave it as it is, but it would be kind of nice to have the, the date working. And again, it's a clock repair channel, so we should repair, try and do some repairs. Okay, so let's just get this uh, pin out here, which might be a nail. Is it a nail? Yeah, it's a bent round nail. Uh, so I'm tempted just to cut it off, but um, let's just try straighten it up. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of these S-shaped uh, sort of things that you find in modern clocks as well. Um, again, I think it's all part of this sort of anti-disaster uh, sort of regime, which I don't really buy into. So just put a tape of pin through there when we're finished. So you, you will have noticed uh, for freeing up components like this, I've started using a bit of an experiment uh, with uh, turpentine spirit. And so there's our pin, which is a nail. I will not be reusing that. Nothing wrong with it, it holds it in place, but uh, that will go back to the client with the rest of the bits. So there's a couple of problems here, three problems in fact. One is that the, is that focusing? One is that the collet, this bit, and the disc are loose. Second is that the disc is bent. And third is that the post is bent as well. So there's kind of quite a lot to go wrong. And the problem with straightening the post, it might be screwed in, which is kind of okay. But if it's riveted into the dial, then of course we've got a painted surface, which is gonna be disturbed when we try and bend it back. So quite a tricky uh, operation. So let's just have a look and see if this is actually going to lift off in the first place. Uh, and the answer is probably no, of course, not easily anyway. 
Um, I'm actually just going to try because it's all quite rusty. See if it's corrosion that's holding it on, or whether it's a mechanical uh, sort of um, issue with it being dropped. And again, this is um, going back to my point about dealing with all this stuff. What I should have done, of course, we we gotten into the clock proper. Um, but normally, if I was doing this for a client, I would do all this stuff first because I personally, and it's only a personal perspective find it a little bit kind of demoralizing to think you've fixed the clock and then do with the dial, which can be days of work. Um, so I kind of like to like to get that out of the way first. And then, you know, you can just pop the whole thing together, but that depends on your sort of overall attitude. I mean, I suppose the point is it isn't over till it's over, uh, whichever way you approach it. Um, I was talking today on uh, Facebook with one of our members from the States who runs a kind of commercial, what is a commercial shop, clock repair shop. And of course, if you're working commercially, these things all add up. And I think that's why, you know, you see a lot of clocks that have been repaired, that the whole thing hasn't been addressed sort of the movement has probably because the person gets to this point and they think oh you know whatever this is another lot of work that I don't really get paid for so I think the important point there is the initial appraisal is really important the kind of condition assessment and treatment proposal uh, because this can double the amount of time that you spend on a on a clock and of course without taking the whole thing apart it's really difficult to see this stuff. So what I tend to do is I'll do a preliminary uh, proposal and then that proposal always includes a line that if I find something else, sometimes I swallow the extra cost. Sometimes I ring up the client and say, look, we've found this. Uh, do you want it doing? And in this case, you know, just don't have the date working. It's not, it's not causing any problems out there. Just, you know, just don't put the pin in the hour wheel and don't have the date working. So this is getting a bit scratchy under there. So I'm going to look for a bit of Melanex or polyester film. Really useful stuff. I'm just going to slide that underneath there. And that's going to prevent the uh, the painted disc surface from scratching on the back of the dial when I just try and gently lift this. We've got some wooden wedges somewhere. I might actually try one of those just to lift the thing up rather than just yanking at it and either breaking something. As I say, I'm mindful of that uh, painted surface as well. So if there is any consolidation to be done there, what I should probably do, yeah. Yeah, so um, what I should actually do is to deal with this first and consolidate this area because moving this rivet is going to cause more losses there. So slightly concerned about that. Uh, probably stole it from somebody. You can buy it from, um, I mean, this is polyester film. So I guess you can, it's used in, I tell you where it's used and I remember where I got it from now. Um, for making stencils, you can buy it in A4 sheets on eBay, or if you go to, uh, conservation resources or preservation equipment limited you can buy it on uh, rolls of different gauges for the stuff that we use it's used extensively in museum conservation for the stuff that we use I always find that this slightly sort of heavier gauge is really useful because um, glue won't stick to it for instance so you can use it for interleaving you can use it to support things it's brilliant. If you've got a moon disc that's rubbing, you can put a bit of that behind. It's like really useful product. 
Uh, and as you can see, it's kind of transparent. I think you can buy it with um, a matte finish as well. There's all sorts available. So preservation equipment, conservation uh, resources. So yeah, that dial certainly needs a bit of um, uh, consolidation. Is it silicone coated? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, no, I don't think so. That's a good question. I think it's just polyester, but it's made by, I think it's made by DuPont and there's just like endless variations on a thing, but it's useful to have a bit, I used it for, uh, on the watch video, which you can find on the other channel. Um, <laughs> All right. And, uh, ICI, ICI is it will make it, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, so let's just put that wedge under there. I used it on the watch repair thing to go uh, between the base of the hand and the uh, the minute hand when I was levering the hand up, which again was rusty. So here, just use the Melanex and uh, this wooden wedge, which is really useful. Hopefully we'll be able to Get a bit of movement here. It's pretty. Oh, there we are. Right, good. So a little bit of gentle wedging. And um, oh my gosh, right, okay. <laughs> you just think you're approaching the um the kind of end of it, and then you see more stuff. Right. So yeah, this is where you as a clock repairer, you think, okay, I'm out of my depth here. Uh, in this case, not that that's really the point, the, the clock's a donation to us for the purpose of showing people how to fix a clock. Um, you know, if it, this were in an institution, I wouldn't have gone this far. I would have, I would have talked to a paintings conservator and said, what do you say? What do you suggest? How are we going to approach this? And work with the team, which is great fun because you always learn something. Um, because what we've got here, look, is... Uh, let me get a some very uh friable paint surface so you can see that actually lifted up there some losses which actually might be able to find out where they came from some uh, probably that's run through from our uh, turpentine there but could have been oiled would have been oiled when the clock was in operation um and we've also got um, some pretty significant distortion of the date disc and the uh, and the collet, which I think right. I'm just going to get a bag and put those fragments in. Um, So um, this is a kind of cool situation because we uh, all in practice have our line. You know, we have uh, the sort of familiar territory and we have the stuff that we know is definitely out of our league. And of course, inevitably uh, and rightly, we have the stuff that's on the border of what we're comfortable with. And this is kind of just beyond my normal comfort zone. I wouldn't tackle this. Uh, as I said, if I was dealing with this clock for a client. However, here it's slightly different circumstances. Um, and you might argue that's uh, when we, uh, when I was at the college, would often undertake uh, repairs that were more uh, restorative than conservative because it gave the students an opportunity to work on something that they might not otherwise and to learn. So I'm just going to pop these fragments in a bag really loose and very fragile just need a different brush spiders webs and all so 
So at least we've ga gathered up some of those fragments of paint and they may be able to be glued back down, but we, uh, we have them. And um, now we have our date disc. So I think what I need to do here is to get some of this oil off here. Uh, you can see over the years, the oil has spread under the paint. There's corrosion under this brass. This disc is brass, I think. Yeah, it is. So there's a kind of copper corrosion. You can see that green that's coming through the paint. The paint has lifted over the years and then the whole thing's gone on the floor. So it's like layers of... <laughs> De uh, deterioration that's um that's kind of life yeah that's life of everything i suppose it's all uh entropy and all that stuff so i think the first thing i need to do is to very gently get some of this oil off because otherwise it's not going to stick down then i'm going to consolidate this uh, with a bit of that uh 10 percent um paraloid that i showed Hold that down. And that's another use for the, um, the Melanex, because when you glue this down with the liquid, what happens is the paraloid uh, gets sucked under the paint with a um, uh, capillary action. But then you need to hold it down. So what I'll do is I'll use a bit of um, a Melanex, then some plastisol foam on the top, and then squeeze that all together into a little sandwich then at least when we come to try and straighten this, that bit of paint that remains has got a chance of, um, of surviving uh, without sort of more and more and more losses. Some around the edge actually isn't too bad. This stuff here is kind of not too bad. It's a bit grubby, um, but it's this bit here that's um, concerning me most. Get that as well yeah this is all absolutely just falling apart so i'm going to do a bit of cleaning there um might make up some as i said before some um deionized water a little bit of bullpex soap a little bit of isopropyl alcohol just to kind of wipe away some of that dust and dirt and uh, oil and the turpentine that we put on as well and then glue that together then I can begin to think about straightening this and maybe re-riveting that collet. But that in its own right is a pretty difficult job. The, um, the disc is hardened. You see this on those bigger date discs and moon discs where they get a lot of stress, corrosion, cracking. Do not clean them in ammonia. Don't clean clocks in ammonia, full stop. But if you do clean the movements, definitely don't clean anything that's thin and highly stressed like this because it will crack and it'll destroy it um hence the seasonal cracking if you haven't heard of seasonal cracking then google it and it's a phenomenon where shells apparently you know made up story maybe but cracked due to ammonia from horse manure in the world war, war was it seasonal cracking and moisture anyway that's what happens when you put um ammonia near uh, stressed brass like this so we've kind of got multiple uh, issues building up here. I think to straighten it, life's kind of quite easy because this in here will be a brooch tip uh, like all these bearings are. So I just file a bit of steel, stick it in there, and that will enable us to gently bend the thing back, um, but only after I've tried to glue down some of this paint. So um, this comes down to our... Uh, whole decision making process and I often say on the Facebook group and when people are raging at me for <laughs> thinking uh, thinking about being conservative or uh, whatever that means um, because the whole thing is a cost benefit exercise and that's not the like the monetary cost obviously there is a cost there because it takes time but the kind of bigger picture sort of thing so we're constantly looking at the sort of intimacies of these tiny bits of paint that are falling off and then the bigger picture, you know, what are we trying to do here? Some people might say, um, uh, oh, yeah, radium. How does Jane know about the radium? I told her. Ah, right. I said maybe picture repair 
World War II watches. Definitely. Of what got yeah, that's a that's gonna be I'm gonna put um, an email, uh, not an email, a tweet tweet out to the industry, whoever they are, um, for advice. So that'll be the BHI, if there's any BHI members there. What is um what uh is the industry advice on dealing with friable radium paint, radium bearing paint. And also from ICON as well, Institute of Conservation. So if any, any of you are members of those institutions, then let's hear what the uh, score is there. Because um, lots of radium bearing dials on eBay, they get exchanged. I don't think it's a problem when it's in the watch, but obviously when you come to repair it, I guess you don't want to be breathing in that uh, dust. So definitely something to uh, think about there. OK, so I think straightening this is the least of our worries. We have to kind of have, uh, uh, accept that there are going to be some more paint losses, but we're going to try and minimise those. And of course, we make that decision whether we want the clock to run or not, or the date to work or not. We've already made a decision for the movement, but we haven't really made a decision about the, the dial, this dial. So we could say, look, the sort of trauma or the intervention to the dial is so much that we're just going to leave it as it is. It's going to become a relic. It won't. We can set it whatever day we want. But I think because this is a repair channel, it would be good to um, progress this and see what it looks like uh, when it's repairing. So just to talk you through it again, uh, because I'll save you from the torture of that, is I'm going to uh, gently clean this I'll clean up gently clean it, clean it with some swabs, a bit of, uh, I've already mentioned the kind of solvents I'm going to use. I'm going to glue down the paint using 10% uh, paraloid acrylic resin in acetone uh, with the Melanex and then some plaster soap foam. Oh, sorry, I keep typing. Um, oh, sorry, that's me typing. <laughs> it's not some coded comment. Uh, my pliers are on the keyboard again. And um, that's what pliers say when pliers speak. Uh, I don't, I, we need somebody to interpret that. Um, and then I'm going to uh, get a bit of steel, file it to a taper, stick it in here, and then bend that thing back, probably pressing down on the top as well and see how it goes. Be quite cool to see if that can be brought back to sort of working order. Then this one here, um, sometimes these are screwed in, sometimes they're riveted in. In this case, I can just get it to focus. It's actually riveted in. So um, it's the stud that's bent, not the dial. So again, kind of an easy-ish sort of repair here. Um, there's a bit of cleaning to do, some dusting and vacuuming and what have you, which I will get my brush out. Maybe I can actually successfully do some vacuuming. That's about the level of it, uh, level of it today. But let's just get rid of some of that uh, dust and stuff there. So I'm going to vacuum into uh, the vacuum cleaner. I don't know whether we've got the is the mesh on there, can you see? Sorry, another distraction. The mesh. Yes. Being a, sorry? Getting the mesh out. Being a northerner, of course, I'm a massive fan of neck curtains. I think they're the best thing ever. And people who don't like neck curtains, oh, don't talk to me about plantation shutters. Anyway, um, and the neck curtain is like incredibly useful if you're cleaning this is one long distraction but i mean life's one long distraction isn't it um if you're cleaning uh, small components in a tray or something you can line it with this which cushions it but it also means you can handle them easy and don't lose them um but what i'm going to use it for here is to go over the end of the vacuum cleaner so you don't suck up any big bits of material I've got a very long uh, and painful story about that I often wondered why, um, oh, not very good, neat cutting, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. But anyway, I often wondered why conservators 
uh, put this over the end of the vacuum cleaner until I uh, vacuumed up part of an historic object, which took me two days to find in the vacuum cleaner bag. But anyway, so I'm just gonna have a quick vacuum here, get rid of this, and then we can try and straighten up this stone. So obviously what you do slightly neater than this is to put the mesh over there. And then when you're dusting, it'll suck up the little bits of dust, but any bigger bits that you didn't want to vacuum up get trapped on there. works my favorite activity right okay so to straighten this stud remember this stud is a brooch tape like all this stuff um yeah there's a i don't know whether it's a, an apocryphal story or not but um i kind of think pick up what i say here um there's a workshop um kind of like one of those even more old-fashioned than my workshop uh, and had uh, I went in there with a curator from a museum, and this is uh, this isn't apocryphal. There were actual pigeons in this actual workshop, and apparently, which anyway, um, one of them picked up some watch screws. Uh, so you can imagine what happened next. Right. So ideally, here what we'll do is maybe drill a bit of brass and um, brooch that out and use it to lever this thing back square. Let's say I'm a bit worried about the painted surface. Let's just, and um, of course the uh, thing might break out with the dial as well. It's all pretty sort of brought with difficulty. So, or it might snap off. Right, so it's kind of straightened up quite well, um, but it's uh, the rivets loose. So again, I need to do a bit of cleaning on the other side of the dial, uh, glue that paint round the rivet. So when we rivet the thing, it doesn't shell all the paint off. I mean, yeah, fraught, fraught with difficulty here. Um, as I say, slightly out of my comfort zone. Um, but what I can do, is a bit more cleaning here with swabs and uh, get rid of some of this old uh, oil and sort of um, impacted dirt and things around there. So I can make progress. That has worked. It's a little bit wobbly, but I've got a feeling that's going to be okay. Yeah, as you can see immediately it uh, fits on and off there better, but this still needs straightening up. Um, and, you know, don't beat yourself up about this stuff too much. It's ever so easy. Uh, just writing for our second book about practice, um, the fact that by definition, clockwork is kind of... Um, I wasn't me with a pigeon. <laughs> um, the pigeon didn't make it, unfortunately. 
there was oh anyway um you know the the thing about working on these on anything i suppose where you literally physically close up is it's really difficult to get any objectivity and you kind of get sucked into the project project and you look closer and closer and closer at it uh, so it's really important to get some objectivity as well. So either physically or emotionally, push the object away. You know, it's really useful if you can build up a habit of pushing the thing right away onto the kind of far horizon and then bringing it really closely in this kind of material nature and continually do that with a kind of um, almost ambivalence to try and retain some uh, objectivity, I suppose. So that's straight. So Ian asks, can you just, could you not just glue the rivet? Yeah. Yeah, could Ian, good idea. You could um, again use some of this uh, paraloid yeah. adhesive and some start with some thin stuff so it gets sucked into the joint and then uh, with something maybe a little bit less dilute than that. So yeah, really good suggestion there. You can definitely glue it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that'll save the trauma of um hammering down on the poor thing so yeah good idea so that's actually it probably needs straightening a little bit more but that's actually quite um reassuring that this thing's going to work so let's just turn our attention for the next few minutes um onto our dial feet so yeah we've got three dial feet and again good point rather than riveting the new dial foot on uh we can um we can uh, glue it in place. Nothing wrong with that. Good idea. So let's just have a measure up of what we're going to need. And um, looking at these dial feet, they're really kind of quite rough for want of a better word. So that's good for us because it means, uh, I'm not sure my camera's focusing at all. Um, that means that we can uh, file the new component Just really uh, quite tricky to see because it's such a compressed image on YouTube, whether or not it's in focus. But anyway, you get the idea. So, uh, yeah, we can file a new dial foot. So that's really cool. I'm just going to make a drawing. Well, laughingly uh, call it a drawing, but you know what I mean? Find myself a pencil. So much choice. Oh, there. Um, Actually, have um, a watch tight job to do for uh, a painting conservator. So I'm going to try and exchange that for uh, an hour of um, their time for Open Clock Club and see if we can get some uh, general advice. And the same thing for their paper. I haven't forgotten about the paper labels uh, person, and they've offered to do it. They're just incredibly busy. So let's have a little look here. Um, let's just take an average of these 9.4, 9.1, 9.6. So let's call it 9.5. And the height is 7.5. Seven point three, seven point four, seven. So we'll make it about seven point five. Then I can just reduce the height uh, to bring it down to level. Um, just reminds me. Um, who knows where these videos are going to end up, but. Um, 
in some areas of conservation, you see people, they prefer if you use a plastic um, uh, caliper, because obviously it's less scratchy than the metal ones. It's not quite as uh, accurate, but it doesn't matter for doing something like this. So it's, again, from a conservation perspective, it's quite nice to have one of these in your toolbox because it uh, looks like uh, you are taking it seriously. Which of course you are. 4.6, 5.2, Gosh, these are all over the place. Incredibly, uh, 5.6, 5.2, 4.9. So always useful to do a little drawing. Well, we can look here as well. Is the size of the hole in the uh, false plate to determine that spigot diameter. I think the holes are absolutely massive by the look of them. Let's double check. So it's, yeah, I mean, um, like acres. Just drill. Use the um, foot of a drill, shank of a drill, whatever it's called. So 5.7 is the biggest diameter that will fit through there. Well, I put 5.9, 5.7 on the height of this bit. Uh, this is a bit dull, 5.8. No, wrong bit. Wrong bit, wrong bit, wrong bit. Eight. 8.3. 8.74. <laughs> Pardon me. And then we've got the... Um, the bit that's going to go uh, riveted into the hole or glued into the hole or screwed into the hole. It doesn't matter, does it? Because we're not, I'm not trying to uh, make it like new. That's uh, impossible. We can't go back, regrettably. Um, so actually, rather than again, bashing away at it, we could just um, put a screw there, a sort of counter sunk screw and then paint over it uh, if we wanted. So let's just have a look at that maximum diameter you can actually buy a drill you can buy the drill stock that these things were made from which make a really useful set of gauges and of course you can buy um, actual gauges as well which are occasionally crop up but for this thing just to gauge the size of the hole so that's it. so the hole's about 4.6 millimeters diameter So there we are, we've got a scruffy old drawing, which I'll turn into a better drawing at some point. So we need um, a bit of 10 millimeter diameter or thereabouts brass stock. Okay, let's have a little root about in our um, materials draw. Let's pop that to one side. We've done our drawing. Yeah, I ain't got one. <laughs> yes, Derek, it would totally agree. Um, but I don't have a lid. I could do it maybe on my watchmaker's lathe, but yeah, if you've got a micro lathe or a bigger lathe, then you can do it in 10 minutes. Like it's easy, but I don't have one. So filing's okay. Don't worry, I won't subject you to uh, an hour and a half of filing. I'll do it um, off camera and uh, present the result. 
kind of quite interesting process of making the taper pin hole in the right place, which I will talk about later. to remind me if I forget. Let's just have a little look. Scrap draw. What? Uh, I'm going to ideally I'd find a bit of cast brass. It doesn't really matter. I mean, CZ131 is quite good for riveting. Uh, but this is what I'm actually after a bit of cast rod. I think that's too small diameter, unfortunately. Yeah, it's too small. Ooh, look. Now, a 131 is good because it's got good turning and riveting properties. CZ120 would work, but it's a bit um, hard. There, that, that'll work well. I've got an old pillar. Kind of, um, in fact, I wonder whether I could actually use that end on there. Don't know where that pillar came from. Well, sound effects. It doesn't have to be a round stock. I could make it from a bit of square. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to try and hide it in, in terms of just a thing to do a mechanical job. Sorry about the noise. I can make it out of wood, plastic. Loads of, um, somewhere I've got some phenolic uh, rod. Could make it out of that. All perfectly reasonable. That's a bit of brass, but I think that's a bit big. Oh, that's 11.8, so it's a, quite a bit of filing, but um, things I'd forgotten about and um, all sorts of old projects. I think the pillar um, might do the job. I've got no idea where it came from. Um, just picked it up along the way, and that's too small. Let's just have a look. Yeah, I don't really mind what the material is. It's to do a mechanical job. I know people uh, get quite animated about using cast brass and that kind of thing. Um, but I think uh, that this offers us um, always really difficult kind of chewing up things that are um, old. Uh, I wouldn't obviously uh, break this out of the plate. You often see five pillar clocks, London long case clocks with the middle pillar taken out. And it's quite a sort of regular job in repair to put, you know, to re to make a new pillar and put that pillar back. People use it for brass or I don't know why they take them out, use it for bushing or something. But I think if I can find my false plate, this is this hole, isn't it? Yeah, it's not quite, it might be. It really isn't going to be that far off in the first place, just um, as it is, basically. It might almost go through there. Um, or we've got a, a stick of cast brass here that I can make um, file it from, but it, I'll turn it from. Yeah, if you've got a lid, stick it in your three-jar chuck, turn it down, turn it round, put it in a collet, uh, job done. But I don't, so I think... Um, yeah, I think I'm going to go with that, uh, unless there's an outcry. But yeah, a bit of plastic, wood, anything would do as long as it um, does the job. But I think if I can retain this part of the pillar, then it'll be kind of quite nice if somebody sees it in the future and sees that a repair has been done using a, an old bit of a clock. So all sorts of interesting kind of uh, principles uh, there. So... And one of those days or one of those sessions that's created about 10 times more work than we started at the beginning. But, you know, some days are like that, aren't they? We uh, covered a lot of ground, as always. Um, we, I think it's good to talk about that um, paraloid 
10% uh, parallel in acetone for consolidation of painted surfaces. It's good to talk about the netting for the vacuuming. Um, thinking about that paint, you know, where in our practice do we draw the line? Where do we say this is uh, another specialism? This is out of my depth or I want to learn that. And that line, of course, where you say yes or no changes the whole time. Sometimes it advances, sometimes it sort of nominally retards uh, and it changes. That's the whole point of practice. We don't want to be in the same place that we are today in five years time, for instance. We want to, uh, I, well, you, you saying move on is a little bit sort of fanciful, but we want to add, we want to change. We don't want to remain the same, which is why there is no set right or wrong way to do things. And because uh, if you get into that mentality, then um, you uh, tend to get stuck and you can't kind of think outside the box, as they say. So I've got uh, quite a lot to do before next week. <laughs> um, I don't quite know which, which bits of this I'll advance. Maybe not the dial. Maybe I should just get the gathering palette done. And then next week we can whack the whole thing together and I can work on this in my time over the holiday and uh, see how things have progressed in September. We'll start with a new clock. So I think that kind of makes sense. Um, just get the, uh, the gathering power done. As you can see, lots of different tasks, projects, challenges, things to think about. You know, that's the great beauty of working on historic objects. And as I always say, there's never, um, there's never any kind of right answer. And inevitably, tomorrow you think, mm, we should do like this, we should try this. That's absolutely fine. That is the name of the game. So there we are. Right. I need to go find a bit of steel and solve that gathering palette. And then uh, we can think about what we're going to do with all this stuff and uh, get the thing finished for early September. Anyway, so as always... Thank you for everybody for bearing with what has been another kind of interesting uh, session and to Team Open Clock Club for keeping the live chat going. So as always, thank you uh, to you people for following along. Uh, <laughs> those aluminium tubes are like from the 1980s um when that shop Occitan was like new on the high street it's like quite a regular sort of shop nowadays and I used to buy those things and think they were incredibly exotic I told my daughter they're off the other day for lighting I said boss that stink put it out <laughs> how things change eh yeah the one I used to have hair back in the 80s anyway uh enough of that so thanks to uh, everybody we'll see you on Saturday at the Open Clock Club we'll see you on Facebook and if not uh, have a great weekend and we'll see you next week for uh, the last in this present thing before we go on holiday of our live stream. So thanks a lot and bye for now. Now, where is that mouse that's causing all the problems?